You're listening to the sound of Canyon Tree Frogs, recorded on a recent trip to the Grand Canyon by today's guest, Aaron English. Today's wildlife ambassador is a source of inspiration for Aaron and the work she does as a senior engineer for biohabitats. Canyon tree frogs live in riparian zones, meaning that they are never found far from streams within the canyon. Just like today's guest, who's never far from thinking about working on water issues in the southwest United States. Stick around to hear stories of inspiration and a hopeful sense of urgency around the need to work with nature to keep more water in the rivers and streams of the southwest. You're listening to the Rewilding Earth Podcast. Aaron English has led constructed wetlands, wastewater, rainwater, and water reuse engineering for award-winning projects that have achieved the Living Building Challenge Net Zero Water and that, at their core, embrace the value of water, ecology, and watershed thinking. Her 20-plus years of experience includes landmark high-performance buildings that prioritize water use, five of which have been awarded AIA Coat Top 10 recognition. Aaron remains committed to the power of living systems to transform our approach to water engineering and infrastructure toward a regenerative future. Frogs, I want to hear all about them. Tell us the story. I recently had this opportunity to spend five days beneath the rim at Grand Canyon National Park. My company and a friend and conservation photographer, Christina Selby, on a trip to document visually some of the springs within the canyon and tell some stories about why they're important. I was really just along for the long walk for, as part of her project. But as time evolved there, we realized that there was so much snow that fell on the north rim of the Grand Canyon this year that like the trails were closed that cut us off from some of our springs that we were trying to go to. And so we actually found ourselves with a lot more time and a considerably shorter number of miles to explore some of the other areas within the canyon since we couldn't get to our original destinations of Roaring Springs, for example, which supplies all the water for the Grand Canyon on the South Rim. And so at Havasupai Gardens, which is halfway up the Bright Angel Trail on the South Rim, it's a spring-fed oasis, really, within the canyon. There's a number of seeps and little intermittent streams that in some areas are perennial, and then the water's kind of coming up and disappearing and coming back up again, and really enchanting place. And there's a population of canyon tree frogs which live there. And it's one of the, I think, the highest, one of the highest densities of these amazing little frogs in the canyon there. And so at dusk, we ventured into where the springs are emerging and you can hear the water running. And there were just like so many frogs. It was so noisy compared to the quiet everywhere else in the canyon. Pretty magical. And so we recorded the video or in, in some audio that I shared with you. And it was this moment for me as a water person to just have this experience of like water that's coming out of the ground, making its way, sustaining this incredibly rich little pocket of biodiversity, birds and frogs and trees and shade on its way to the Colorado River and joins with the Colorado River and then becomes part of this like much bigger, hard to wrap our heads around, highly political story that is a defining story of the West, at least right now it's in this extended drought and all of the challenges with figuring out how to sustain the population with this water from the Colorado River. And so just being able to hang out with these tree frogs for a little bit and experience just the really special little pockets of life that are sustained by this water, it amplified for me the bigger story, like why this is so important that we're protecting water in all of its forms and all the places where it occurs. You get probably really grounded at moments like that. You probably go back to your office with a stricter sense of your real priorities. Like what really needs to be done? How can I do more to and keep that in mind <laughs> as I'm doing the work that I do? 
which isn't always visiting the Grand Canyon, right? And, and listening to Canyon tree frogs. That's right. That's right. And in fact, I'm a water engineer by training and trade for the last 20 years now. And, and I get a lot of puzzled looks when I tell people that I work and live in the southwestern deserts. I live in New Mexico. And this is surprising to many people outside of the southwest of like, why are you a water engineer in the desert? And I think it's one of those opportunities to really help people see that like perhaps the best place to be as a water engineer is in the desert where we have a different relationship with that preciousness of the water, the value of the water, all of the ways that it has sustained cultures for millennia here. And it's very tenuous nature when it comes to the impacts of development, the impacts of climate change, the impacts of like overutilization. It being a water engineer in the dry, in a dry place is, I think, the best training one could have. Um, and yeah, I don't get to usually hang out in the and watching tree frogs, though I do make a habit of getting out into the wild places in the watershed in which I live and really experiencing the water that sustains the place that I call home. So much of what we talk about, and especially in the West, when it comes to water is about plumbing. It's really the nuts and bolts. How much water is there? Why are we damming up this place when it, the dam's almost empty? Oh, great. There was a big snowpack and now there's some water back in the dam and the drought's over, everybody. Woo and all of those conversations are the primary ones that are going on right now in the West. And to me, that's all plumbing. And there's nothing like your story about visiting the Canyon tree frogs in the big news, in the headlines and things. And I just really love to have that conversation whenever I can, because it's so few and far between. And there's some reason that you're drawn to this, this kind of work. What is it about water in general? that's beyond the plumbing of everything that gets you? Yeah, that's a really big question, right? <laughs> I'm really intrigued by this book called Blue Mind, which is about what happens to our minds when we are close to water and that there's this calming effect and that there's this recognition perhaps physiologically in us as humans that the water is what sustains us. And I think it's as simple as that. And I feel like a lot of us forget that because it is plumbing, right? Like we flush the toilet, we turn on the tap and we don't, we lose that connection as a result of the plumbing itself, like literally with where our water is coming from and where it's going to. And so for me, I have to like constantly remind myself, go back out and reconnect with where that water is coming from. and. This is something that's not so hard to do where I live in the northern New Mexico landscape here, but it's harder for many of our clients and many of our collaborators and people we work with around the U.S. that maybe don't live so close in that way to where the water is coming from. And so to me, having that continued relationship with those special experiences of water in natural and wild places is what I think as an engineer, I hope at least to bring to the community I work with, which are de like designers, architects, builders, owners of projects of different scales, like universities, or even some developers, right? Is like, how do we bring and translate this knowledge of what we know about the value of water, what I know about the value of water into a project so that it doesn't just devolve into the plumbing? And granted, we design a lot. I design a lot of plumbing. <laughs> There's no question. I have to have pumps and, mm -hmm. and valves and pipes, but we are, I think there's an opportunity to redefine how we are living in the built environment with water so that we can help sustain these wild places, right? Both upstream of where we live and dwell and then downstream so that we have clean water, abundant water within our matrix of how we're developing. Because right now, there's so much, there's so much downside to what's happened with the built environment, what ha into our rivers, our streams, wetlands, the destruction is just, it's astounding. Aside from the people that our listeners have met from biohabitats, many engineers and uh, 
I think a lot of people's experience with engineers is like more on the core of engineers side. You've got your foot in two worlds that I don't think a lot of people picture an engineer having their mm. feet in. It's not a traditional role. I have great faith that the engineers who are coming out of school now and who are looking at the reality of what this sort of like gray infrastructure engineering mindset has done, this is changing. It's going to take some time, but that is happening. And I'm really encouraged by that. And I can see it within biohabitats and I can see it within the other people we're working with. Now that said, there are disservices that have been done by the engineering profession that are hard in the West. That it was the it's just a lack of understanding is the way I see it. A lack of understanding the science of ecology. And I feel really lucky <laughs> that my first job out of college that I pursued was for a nonprofit, ecologically oriented engineering firm or ecological engineering firm called Ocean Arcs, working with a visionary biologist called Dr. John Todd, who helped create the science or the practice of ecological engineering or helped at least elevate it um, beyond sort of the textbooks and imagining this idea of like nature as co-creator, nature as partner when it comes to cleaning water. He created this concept of a living machine or like a living filter that cleans water using plants and beneficial bacteria. And this is it's not new. This is 30, 40 50 years he's been working on that, but the the impact that that type of thinking and training has had on me as an engineer and most of the other engineers that I have the pleasure of working with is, cannot be overstated. It's, it's a different way that engineers, I think, can apply the same intellect that we have and like passion that we have for doing good work in a way that like is in partnership with nature. And, you know, that shift isn't that big of a leap. It's just we're not always training engineers and showing them. And so I do feel like that's shifting. The more we can connect people with those wild places and talk about the like potential, because that's the, what this is about. It's like the potential of using nature-based solutions, the potential of having systems that are a little less in our control, right? Living systems, they're less in our control. <laughs> they take some trust and take some experimentation, take some risk. But the more that we can develop within the engineering profession, that kind of thinking and practice, the more that we can be designing our stormwater infrastructure, our wastewater systems, even our, some of our water supply systems so that they're working with nature. So like literally like systems that are increasing biodiversity. We design a lot of treatment wetlands, constructed wetlands for filtering wastewater and for also filtering stormwater or even lakes and ponds so that we're providing more habitat more biodiversity, more, more access for birds and amphibians while also cleaning and filtering water and using less energy, less carbon footprint. These are like really exciting types of projects that I think engineers, if we get everybody on board, with this is the potential of what we could be doing. I have a pretty good, I feel like the prognosis is pretty good for engineers to make that turn. Biohabitats is proud to sponsor this episode of the Rewilding Earth podcast during the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. And always, Biohabitats applies the science of ecology to restore degraded ecosystems, conserve habitat, and regenerate the natural systems that sustain all life on Earth. Ecological restoration is positive action that you can take and support today. It's also incredibly rewarding and a lot of fun. Learn how you can get involved in the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration by exploring the links in extra credit. Is it really that much harder? I imagine that when you're given a project and it's like, all right, guys, it's time to work with nature. And we have all of these new considerations we never took in the 50s or the 40s or the 30s when we were building just we needed this water. And we needed to build a canal and a dam or whatever. And it seems ecological considerations were at the very bottom of the list if they were on it at all. That's right. But from a lay person's point of view, it sounds like an easier engineering task because you didn't have to care about any of that other stuff. And then I've evolved over the years to think, is it really truly that much harder to build with nature, to engineer with nature in mind? 
And could it also be more beneficial and maybe make some things even easier than the old way? It's a really good question. On the whole, I fully agree. It's easier. The benefits are far beyond the shorter term gains that we might get from damming a river or from straightening and channelizing and distributing water through highly engineered distribution systems across multiple states. That is crazy if you think about it, right? It's mm -hmm. crazy, crazy. It's absolutely wild. Some of the larger scale infrastructure projects that we've developed in the past to de deliver water. People you tell that story and people don't even believe it. That could be real. And so I think if you look at it this way, you know, that we're designing water systems that are like based in their own watershed, that are relying upon their own two, two legs or 10 legs or whatever to, st to stand and not all of this import and export. I think just intellectually, that is easy to understand, that it's simpler to go within the natural conditions of where you're working. However, most of the... I'm, I can't even get into water rights because that is a whole other pickle. But like most of the like regulation that has been developed and or best management practices or requirements, those are not always so friendly to natural systems solutions. And I, I don't, the, but those are also easier to change than some of these longer term interstate water compacts. But natural systems or nature-based technologies are open systems. They are subject to climate variability and to weather and storms and insects and all sorts of like good things, right? So there's just some variability that can happen sometimes with how these are performing. But they're the idea is that they would be performing in step with what the natural kind of conditions in a watershed would be. Like, so for example, a large treatment wetlands, constructed wetlands, can be used instead of a state-of-the-art wastewater treatment plant when we have to upgrade, let's say, a municipal facility. There are hundreds and hundreds of municipal wastewater treatment facilities that are performing fine, but they're not really that advanced when it comes to removing nutrients or pollutants of emerging concern like estrogen and antibiotics. And this stuff's getting into our rivers from our wastewater systems. And so we could put in very advanced, high-tech wastewater treatment facilities. Those work well. Um, and also in other places, we could put in large polishing treatment wetlands, which we have been doing. There's a bunch of this work happening to filter out those contaminants, to transform that nitrogen, to cool the water. We've done somewhere we're actually cooling the water to protect the fishery because wastewater is inherently warm. <laughs> And then, you know, we're also creating opportunities for birds and for wildlife watching and for all kinds of species. It's a build it and you will come. Are those going to perform in the same way every single day, like a treatment plant that has like a super fine membrane on the back of it? Maybe not always. And so having that kind of flexibility within the way that on the whole that they are viewed, I think is going to be an important evolution in the codes so that these truly like nature-based solutions can be put in without the risk that an engineer would fear otherwise. Is it possible that there's any rewilding project of any scale that's not affected uh, positively by a great project that just went online or negatively by old projects that need to be updated? It feels to me like it, we're hyper-dependent in any rewilding situation, large or small, on how everybody upstream is acting and doing. Yeah, I think that's right. And in, in considering having this conversation with you today, where most of my actual work is within the built environment, right? Transforming how it is that we treat and harvest and reuse water for domestic and community use, right? It is not so easy to make that link with what is upstream and downstream. but. I, if we look at where most of the water pollution is coming from in places where we are, where there are active rewilding projects going on or where they're contemplated, the kinds of pollution that we're seeing are from urbanization. So stormwater, runoff, metals, hydrocarbons, all kinds of nasty things. It's from wastewater treatment plants that are underperforming or that were never designed for the level of like pharmaceuticals that we put into them from, from people. And then also from agriculture, 
right? So the agricultural runoff is a huge one that is a little more challenging because it's so decentralized. So certainly within the urban and suburban and developed context, better managing our water close to where it falls. So good green stormwater infrastructure. So every, we know how to do that. We know it's possible. We just need to continue to implement it. Combined with wastewater management at the municipal scale and at the small scale, there's a lot of groundwater pollution that's happening from septic systems and from places that don't have access to some of the more advanced wastewater treatment. There's a lot of, there's a lot of pollution happening that we can't see. And so all of that comes around oftentimes those that groundwater is going to interface with wilder places at some point, right? Some ways there it's you know, the, what goes around comes around when it comes to the water cycle, right? It's just a matter of time. And so having better stewardship of our water quality and reducing that pollution within the built environment really is imperative for this idea of clean water for the sake of rewilding. Absolutely. And then also like, it's not just downstream, it's also upstream. And so using less water is a big focus of mine personally, when we can find ways to, we do like a lot of rainwater harvesting, gray water and wastewater treatment and recycling um, so that we're not using fresh, beautiful, clean, potable water to flush our toilets. That's a ridiculous thing to be doing. We should not be flushing toilets with beautiful, pristine mountain water or groundwater. We should not be irrigating turf grass and frankly, most of our landscapes with beautiful, pristine stream and groundwater. <laughs> we can treat and recycle and reuse water. The technology exists. We know how to do it. We can do it with natural systems. We can do it with hybrid systems. We can do it with fully mechanical systems if that's all that we have as a choice so that we are leaving the water in the river. So we are leaving the water in the ground. So we are like creating more abundance upstream that we don't have to like continuously draw down. There's so much damage that's done from the extraction of water for human use, right? And this is true for agriculture, but I'm also really speaking about the urban, urban context in this case. No matter where you do this work, it has an effect that's far greater than like the city fish that wear leather coats and smoke and cat call the exotic carp species as they float down the stream. <laughs> it's not just about them. It's about all mm -hmm. the fish and the ones that downstream whose pupils are dilating a little bit because there's too much of a, a pharmaceutical getting through the <laughs> Or all the frogs are female. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I like that. I love how you told that story and made that connection for us because I feel like it's a connection that's really needed and that people should really explore a lot more in thinking about this stuff. It's not all just about wild and built. That's what the water does, right? It connects the wild with the built. And where I live in Santa Fe, you know, our river completely disappears most of the time between our water treatment plant, which is at the base of the mountain, and then our wastewater treatment plant, which is good 10 miles downstream. There's no river in between. The river is running through the plumbing <laughs> and through the people, through the toilet, and then to the wastewater treatment plant, and then back to the river. The river springs back to life just downstream of the wastewater treatment plant, like literally at the end of the pipe where it's discharged. And so if there is not a clearer example of this, I don't know where there is. <laughs> sure. it's, we, the river is in us when we're in the city of Santa Fe. It's a, it's a wild thing. And I go both upstream and downstream to I take people there. I'm about to take most of our company up to the upper part of it to look at it next week. We've got people visiting and it's just, a, it's one of those things where the permeability is broader than we think between the built and the wild and the water is the connector. Aside from the river disappearing for a stretch, how, is Santa Fe doing with what they are putting out on the other end? A mixed bag. There's a wastewater treatment plant that could use some upgrades and there's going to be some other. Santa Fe's in the process of, of considering some return flows back to the Rio Grande because we actually have a little bit of water from the Colorado River watershed that's plumbed across the continental divide into the Rio Grande which is one of those wild infrastructure projects that's hard to imagine. 
but we are going to be returning some of our water back to the Rio Grande. And for that to really work, we're going to need to upgrade our systems from a water quality perspective. But for now, the water that's downstream of the wastewater treatment plant, while not perhaps perfect, it's pretty amazing. There are beaver, there are very much a wild, alive river corridor down there. There's a number of irrigators and communities, traditional communities, who rely on that river water. There are some incredible wild places that have been protected by Trust for Public Land and some BLM land and some tribal Pueblo land that go all the way to the Rio Grande. And so it's actually a really special thing to see that river still in its wild state, even though it's 100% wastewater. Wow, 100%. <laughs> Yeah. For all the years I lived down there, it never even occurred to me that the water I was looking at was 100% wastewater. 100%. It's, that's yeah. insane. That is so wild. Yeah. We, that doesn't, nothing brings into focus the responsibility of one place <laughs> because most of the people who've had any experience with that watershed, with that river on the downside, I don't think a lot of people think of that as 100% wastewater. Nope. Nope. It's beautiful. For one, it's like you said, with the mm -hmm. beavers and everything else, it's, it looks like a, a, a very natural environment in places. And we all take it that way. Again, I lived there for so long, it never even occurred to me, yeah. like, this place is beautiful. Yeah, thanks to Wild Earth Guardians and others who've done some restoration work down there. It's partly why it is like that. But yeah, it is, it's a fascinating story. And right now it's not 100% wastewater because there's enough snow melt that there's actually mm. water coming down the whole channel of the river. And the city of Santa Fe, we actually helped them about a decade ago create a living river ordinance that allows them to ensure they don't violate any water rights issues by, by essentially allowing water to flow into the river and not just in the reservoirs on these years that we have big snow melt and then you know, when we have enough water coming in that to, to match the natural, the natural hydrology of the river, the natural flows. And so it's working well for Santa Fe. We've been able to restore 10 miles or eight miles of that river channel and sustain a lot of those plants through this living river ordinance to keep that water flowing when we can. But the vast majority of the time, there's no water in that river, hmm. except for wastewater downstream. I hadn't planned on asking this question, but you brought up the snowpack and I have an engineer here, so I have to ask this question. What does it mean to you as a, a resident in the Southwest, the landscape, the drought, the mega, mega doesn't even really capture it anymore. As I said before, being a water engineer in this high desert elevation, there is no norm. This is like the best place to like really wrap my head around that. Is that if there is any normal here, it is there is no normal. And so even like long-term drought, like we've had long-term drought, right? We've had years of like extraordinary, like long-term drought punctuated by extraordinarily high flows and really highly intense storms or big snowpacks, followed by years with no snow <laughs> and very poor monsoon patterns. It's hard to get excited except for like in the moments when you can celebrate the presence of water, which is what I do. And everybody here that I know also does the same thing. If it's raining or snowing, it's really a good day. And so we enjoy that. But that in the long term, like it's just more motivation to make sure that like our infrastructure and our natural, like the, and I say infrastructure in the context of we, we should be designing our places, our landscapes, the, our natural infrastructure in a way that like takes advantage of it when it happens, store that water in the soil, get it into the ground minimize what happens when we get big storms and runoff is flash flooding and making a mess, get that water in the ground, get that water to slow down. The, to me, that it's just lessons in that we have to be adaptive, like many desert creatures, right? Take advantage of the good stuff when it's here <laughs> and then be prepared to burrow down when it's not. And I think that is the pattern in the Southwest. We have obliterated that ecological knowledge and cultural knowledge. There's a cultural knowledge here that knows this too, that like you have to respond in a way that's knowing that while it's good now, we have to be always prepared for change. And so most desert creatures are adapted to live in this way. And what have we done with these large scale infrastructure projects? We've flattened that curve. We've artificially created a situation where our perception is that the water is always there. 
You know, even in these mega droughts, we still have, I was just down on the Colorado River. There is a ton of water moving through the Colorado River. It was 20,000 CFS when I was there. They were going to do a pulse up to almost 40,000. It looks good, right? On the surface, mm-hmm. you see these things. It's, I, I think to me, it's like that lesson of the desert creatures who've, who, who recognize, or the desert cultures who've recognized that we have to be ready for, for variability because that the one constant is change. If you could go back in time and tell anybody about building a ginormous dam in the Southwest, when they thought the water was forever, it would always be there and everything. Like, how crazy is it knowing what you know? And then just thinking about the mindset of the people who thought the Hoover and Glen Canyon were good ideas because, and they built them with the idea that water would always be there and they would always be full, or at least for a lot longer than they ever imagined it ended up being. I think it's fair to say that there's a lot we don't know. And I'm sure at that time, there was, I give them some credit for not knowing, mm. not understanding the larger hydro, hydrological cycles. I think that's not true across the board. I think Powell, I think there was a few folks who were aware that the Colorado River is maybe not so abundant as once thought and who had put out some warnings about that. But generally speaking, I think people do it out of not ill will, but just lack of knowledge. And so the science of ecology has really evolved and we have. There are lots and lots of really good study on this kind of stuff. People who are focusing on these bigger picture items when it comes to how we manage water. So I think it's a collab, this idea of a collaborative, multi-perspective approach is really the only way that we could solve that problem. And without the benefit of that, those dams were built. That's what I would say is that you can't, an engineer should never engineer without an ecologist and a hydrologist. And that's like exactly why biohabitats is structured the way we are with engineers and scientists and the ecology and the science together. We, and you could argue like the culture and there's, there's a lot of other pieces, right? But this idea of collaborative design is, I think that's where a lot of people have landed, right? With looking at climate adaptation and all of this work we need to do to figure out how to go forward in this really intense climate change situation that's here and that's coming. You paint a picture that is alluring and hopeful more so than I had when we started talking today about the outlook. You make it seem like there are a lot more people coming out of the university system ready to go with more of the right tools than they ever have before. And I like that. I love hearing that. (laughs) We all curl up in a ball if we don't have any sense of hope, you know, that any of the work that we're going to do is going to amount to anything. So I always love digging those kinds of things out. Talk more about what you think about the future. Like, where is where is all this headed now that we have all these better tools and better understanding, given that we don't know everything yet? And there's somebody in the future who will listen to this podcast and go, wow, how much they all, they still didn't know. <laughs> but that's exactly. just normal. But what's it look like to you in your future? Let's focus on the Southwest. What are some of the cool things you think are going to come of all of this new knowledge and the new way you guys are working differently than your predecessors? Yeah, it's a good question. I think, I think that there's been a buildup of this, uh, this work and this understanding over the last 30 or 40 years, perhaps longer, and that what needs to happen is that the the pace of then the implementation and the change needs to go much faster than it has been. Because I feel like there's been a period of making a case for these ways of doing working with nature-based solutions and green infrastructure and water reuse. It's been evolving. And now it's time <laughs> to really implement at a bigger, broader, faster larger scale than ever before, because that is, that's what's needed for me to continue to remain hopeful is that there's been at least proof of concept for a lot of this stuff. And there's been a tremendous amount of innovation and better science, but now it's okay. We've got to get the the regulations evolved, the money in place, the land available because a lot of these nature-based solutions take up more space than the mechanical or hard engineered solutions. And so to me, there is the, 
a, it is a hopeful situation, but we, for that to really be true, we need to go faster and bigger. And so that is a really complicated thing <laughs> within multiple jurisdictions and all the different, particularly in the West, like the multi-agency collaboration, cooperation between federal and state lands and et cetera. But with that said, I feel like there are a couple things that are going to just become normal for us. And one of those is water reuse and water recycling. We are going to stop using pristine mountain water for silly things like flushing our toilets. And already most places are not watering their golf courses with it, for example. There's going to be a lot more of that. The water recycling and reuse at the city scale and then the smaller scale, which we tend to work at the smaller scale, like small community or even na neighborhood scale. There's going to be more of that. And then in in the bigger picture, like in California and Florida, places that are like also really subject to some of the same challenges in the Southwest, th that water recycling is going to go to drinking water. It's going to be drinking recycled water. That's coming. And all of that basically in my mind is that's good. But if all it does is serve us to develop more and have more density, then there's a loss there. I we've I've been pretty clear, at least on a lot of our projects when we have this opportunity that like if we're recycling water, we want to recognize that like we're also trying to keep the water in the river, keep the water in the ground, keep the landscape sustained. And so that's the other part is that this recognition of water, the value of water for the sake of the river, for the sake of the wild is, has to be in parallel with all of this like great technological improvement that we're, we are seeing now and that we will continue to see, right? So I'm hopeful, but I'm also like, it's cautious because we could just continue to like recycle water for the sake of growth. That is not the point. <laughs> and so I think going forward and carrying both of those messages forward, we have all the, we have a lot of the tools we need. We just need to make sure we keep our priorities in the right places. So as other conservationists are working on projects, working on things in their area, and they don't typically spend a lot of time thinking about what everybody upstream's doing, doing the built environment stuff and how important that is, you've made abundantly clear here today, they need to be thinking more about that and maybe even helping that process along. Although it wouldn't need that much help because the politics and lawmaking and everything go at such a blistering fast pace in this country <laughs> that we should have this problem knocked out by this time next year. I'm yeah, sure. easy peasy. <laughs> <laughs> it's really wild, too, how there's this gap always between what you guys on the ground know and how that trickles up so ever slowly to places of power where laws can change to reflect what you've learned. Because, like, you kept referring back to We've known about some of this stuff for 30 years. It's been evolving for 40 years. And I certainly don't see any kind of the politics, the laws keeping pace with the kind of pace that you've talked about in your growth of knowledge and experience in all of this. I think that's true across the board, wherever you're talking about people on the ground versus the politics of things. But it is quite frustrating because I now sense that you have, I sense you now have an idea that if we were really to go big with this, we could really do some serious infrastructure, giant scale good. At, that's right, at the big scale, and but also at the small scale, because some of this giant infrastructure, huge stuff takes years and billions of dollars. It's not that nimble, right? And so that is partly why we tend to work at the smaller scale, because people can move faster. And if you bundle up a bunch of those smaller actions, there is a real benefit on the larger scale. So that's just an important piece is that we need both. It's not either or, it's both ends. But right now, the innovation is at the smaller scale. And there have been some great commissions and some work in certain states like Colorado and California to embrace that. There's been real leadership there from the San Francisco Public Utilities Commissions and others to help evolve those rules so that some of this can move faster and be more consistent. But you're right. At the larger scale, it's harder to see it. Harder to see it. But it needs to happen there, too. There will be a bunch of extra credit, as always, on this episode of the Rewilding Earth podcast. And 
Aaron will ply me with all kinds of things I'm sure that we can look at and get involved with and consider, especially if anyone here has been inspired by the work that Aaron does and maybe trying to figure out how the heck would you find yourself in a position like that? What kind of schooling? And that's the weird question for everybody at Biohabitats, right? Because nobody, nobody at Biohabitats, I don't think, went to college to work at Biohabitats and have the title that they ended up with. It's Not yet. It's so weird. <laughs> Yeah, but I'm, I hope that we can help that happen one day. Like I did go to school so I could work at Biohabitats or a place like that. And I wanted that weird title that very few people have because it's such a combination of backgrounds and education. So what do you think of it? It is really weird how you ended up here. I'm sure I bet you have your weird story because it seems like everybody does. This is not what you thought about when you were 10 years old, or maybe it was. It might have been not too far off. I'll be honest with you. Yeah. <laughs> I've been on this path since I was young. And I think that's actually what I would say in closing is that to me, we can study science, we can study engineering. All of this work requires good technical basis or good communication skills or good business development skills. However, like the underlying connecting factor, at least in my company and I think in this work in general, is like a love of nature. That is, if there's one thing that binds all of us together, and this goes back to the Kenyan tree frogs here, is like cultivating that love of nature in these wild places is, I think, the best preparation when paired with solid technical training. But because the technical training is only going to take any person so far, and we can continuously renew ourselves in nature and find that connection, that is what is shared among every person I know that works at Biohabitat. Aaron, thanks so much for taking the time, and I hope to have you back one day and you can tell us about some success story that you might even be working on right now that you're very proud of. And just keep us in the loop on these things because I find this stuff fascinating and exciting. I'm very excited about people like you and your energy for this work, without whom we would be in a world of trouble far more than we are today. So thank you so much for your time today and your dedication to your craft. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank, thank you for the invitation. Thanks for listening to the Rewilding Earth podcast. We do what we do because of you. This podcast is supported by listeners like you who long to live in a wilder world. Please consider donating at rewilding.org and subscribe to our weekly news and article digest while you're there. To go the extra mile, you can follow and share Rewilding Earth on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Bonus points for sharing this podcast with your friends. To listen to past episodes, go to rewilding.org slash pod. That's rewilding.org slash pod.